Thanks for joining us. I'm Kasturi Manikam. We begin with China's poverty reduction campaign. It's been seven years since Beijing announced the plan to eliminate extreme poverty by the end of 2020. As the country of 1.4 billion people march ever closer to the finish line, the big question is, what's next? Welcome to our special coverage on China's poverty alleviation efforts called The Last Mile. We're here in this ancient town of Tongchuan in Santai County in southwest China's Sichuan province. Right now you can see some local dancers are performing an act behind me. This dance troupe is actually made up entirely of local elderly aunties, some of whom are farmers who have plowed land for their whole lives. My colleagues So Yun and Jonathan Betts are standing by for us in our field studio with a great show lined up for us. They're also here in Santai County, but they venture deep into the villages. Hey guys, before I let you take over the show though I just want to say that the performance behind me actually stretches on for the night so when you guys are done with the studio we're coming back for more of this delightful performance guys take it up from here Thank you so much, Taoyuan. Just marvelous performances out there, right? Sounds like a lot of fun. Looking forward to that later in the show. Exactly. <laughs> and hello again. And welcome to our special coverage of China's poverty eradication efforts the last mile. I'm Zhou Yun. A lot to celebrate. I'm Jonathan Betts. We are live once again from Jiangshan Village in Santai County. This is the fourth time our mm -hmm. team has visited this particular county in remote southwestern China because we've been tracking the efforts over the past four years to improve lives as China works to eliminate extreme poverty by the end of this year. Uh, so far, we covered regions that have been lifted out of poverty and also those who are still on their way. And today we'll explore the efforts to achieve moderate prosperity. So a big part of achieving that is frankly is finding jobs. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese government has been encouraging and working with companies to step up and work with the underprivileged. And also, in addition to the efforts of the government and some other organizations, you know, the role of companies, especially in the private sector, are now playing an increasingly important role in this campaign. Let's take a look. 109,000 private companies in China have invested 107 billion yuan as part of the poverty eradication plan. They've helped some 15 million people, creating 199,000 jobs and providing professional training to a million people. In 2015, the All China Federation of Industry and Commerce and the State Council's Poverty Relief Office launched a program called 10,000 Companies Help 10,000 Villages. The program aimed to mobilize private enterprises to help poor villages over the course of three to five years and accelerate the process of eliminating poverty in China. It combines public welfare donations, development of local industries, and employment of people from poor households. As China looks to eradicate absolute poverty by the end of this year, you know, villages across southwestern Sichuan province mm -hmm. are now already looking ahead at ways to tackle relative po poverty in the long term. Reporter Weiling Tan has reports. The annual season may be over for picking Teng Jiao, translated in English as rattan pepper, a type of Sichuan green pepper. But workers tending to the plants here, trimming them and applying pesticides are still getting paid. We are already senior in age. I'm 69, but I quite like what I do here. I get to earn some extra income. I make about 10,000 yuan a year working at this base. At the heart of any sustainable program to eradicate poverty, jobs and a decent income. Both of these depend on how industries develop and succeed. 
at this industrial park, rattan pepper is processed into a seasoning for hot pot and fish, various oils and sauces. Research and development is also being done in how it can be applied to other downstream products such as shampoo and skincare. These products fetch a higher price and value on the market. And if you're like me, if you're wondering if this stuff smells like pepper, it actually doesn't, but pepper is an ingredient in it. Of our country's total poverty alleviation funds, 70% is derived from the central, provincial and city government's allocation. Without this policy support, it would be very hard for us to properly shake off poverty on our own. That's why we need to expand our market industrial chain and increase our market competitiveness by making value-added products. Leading enterprises here have a guaranteed purchase policy with cooperatives or farmers. They agree to buy rattan pepper at a price that is higher than its cost in a situation where market prices fall below cost. Sichuan Sichou is a major shareholder in a cooperative managing rattan pepper here. We seek to increase farmers' income in multiple ways. Firstly, they can transfer their land to a co-op, which they obtain a fixed rent. They can also earn income from working at the co-op or the industrial park. Additionally, farmers who opt to become a shareholder in the co-op via land transfer can receive dividends from a share of net profits made by the co-op. Local authorities are already looking at ways beyond 2020 to solve relative poverty. That's defined as when people's income is not able to keep up with a standard of living determined by the society that they live in. The threshold for relative poverty for our pilot villages here is set at one-third of the country's 2019 per capita disposable income. But even if a household's income exceeds this, if the family doesn't have the ability to perform labor or if a member is seriously disabled or ill, we will still place him in the relative poverty group and will still provide minimum living guarantees for this really in need. As China looks ahead to a 2021 free from extreme hardship, officials say targeted interventions will still be needed for the country to build on these foundations and tackle the long-term challenge of relative impoverishment. Wei Lintang, CGTN, Santai County, Sichuan Province. Continuing our discussion here live from the Zhanshan village in Saitan County from Sichuan province. Now we have a guest joining mm -hmm. us is Mr. Gou Yung, the uh, president of the county federation of trade unions and also member of the county's communist party committee. So thank you so much for joining us. So we know so many people, they have this kind of concern. You know, there's a risk for those uh, villages that are already lifted out part of it. They have the risk of falling back again. Mm -hmm. So is there any measures that you can share with us to prevent that from happening? Screw the screening of uh, the families at risk of falling back to poverty. We for these two kinds of families, we take two kinds of measures. The first measure is to conduct a full-scale and normalized screening. And we conduct dynamic management of these families. On the other hand, the county-level government make up for the shortcomings in our work and uh, we ensure their alleviation by making 11 rules to increase their income and get them employed. In the development of our industries, we have uh, over 2,000 jobs open to attract excellent talents. And uh, we organized over 1,400 people to be employed in key companies in Mianyang City. At the same time, over a thousand talents are attracted to start 
600 or so business entities. Through such mixed measures, we want to ensure these people to have stable income. So this county, it's worth right. noting, is officially out of poverty, but yet challenges do remain. So I'm curious to know what he thinks are the biggest challenges and what they plan to do to try to overcome that. From the current situation in Santai County, through the efforts of the people across the county, we have a great development in our economy, but uh, we are still faced with many challenges, mainly to, to maintain the quality of the current achievements. So the county government take measures in two aspects. On the one hand, we will continue to implement the current policies to create jobs for the impoverished people, especially for those who are at risk of falling back to poverty. We combine preferential policies with inclusive ones to explore long-term mechanism to tackle relative poverty. On the other hand, we ensure the employment of the impoverished people, and thirdly, we nurture featured, locally featured industries. We connect these policies with the rural development. County level and uh, provincial modern agricultural park are being quickly established. Agriculture and tourism are both developed to ensure the quality rural industries. Mm -hmm. The pillar industries such as lily turf, green citron pepper, and live pig mm. industries, new bases so are built so for these industries. For this. We always say, Jonathan, you know, you know, the uh, the devils are in the details. So it is those very, very concrete <laughs> measures, and you know, it's like a policy toolkit that helps mm -hmm. from the risk from happening and also to boost sustainable development. So thank you again, Xi Xinjiang, Go Xinjiang. Very well Xinjiang. thought out plan. Okay, we appreciate that. Well, it's mm -hmm. also worth emphasizing that Sichuan, you know, where we are right now, is not alone in this campaign. China's lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty across this country. Mm -hmm, that's right. And now let's go live to our reporter. Zhou Jiaxin in Checheng County, which emerged from poverty last year and is now eyeing for higher goal. Well, hello there, Jiaxin. So first of all, can you share with us about the secrets behind Checheng's progress and also the achievements it's been made? Uh, yes, so Yuan, I'm standing in one of the most popular layside amusement squares here in East Henan's Checheng County. Often you see a lot of people here group dancing and taking leisures, but you'd never I uh, believe Georgian was a national defined poverty stricken county prior to May 2019 uh, when the promises 32 other counties had already shaken that title. And to overcome the burden, local governments in the beginning placed emphasis on several poor villages uh, which had been established as pilot cultivation areas for uh, vegetable crops. And in these pilot areas, 150 hectares. Uh, land owned by farmers were transformed into areas for cooperative commerce that's aligned 800 uh, households to make money off the land. And thanks to this system, over 36,000 people have been lifted out of poverty, with 150,000 earning wealth from the county's traditional chili industry. And besides industrial development, anti-poverty -po work has channeled financial and personal support uh, into education, health care, and housing for targeted groups. And in the day, I got the chance to visit the county's largest chili market, where I met a woman who has helped villagers out of poverty with her skills in e-commerce. Let's take a look. When sales executive Wang Chen gave up her high-paying job in East China's Yiwu, a city with the world's largest small commodities market with a vibrant e-commerce sector, the 28-year-old's ambition was to create new opportunities in her hometown an impoverished village in central China's Henan province. 
I didn't hesitate to come back, but everyone in the family were unhappy about it, except my father. My five-year-old son back then asked me, "Mom, are we out of money? You had a good car, but now you don't. Mom, are you in debt? Because you are too busy every day to care about me. Mom, let's leave the countryside. It's dirty." One admits walking on the countryside road after the rain was almost impossible. Back then, the county was nationally defined as poverty-stricken, but she returned with one goal in mind: to apply e-commerce to rural development, especially the county's prominent chili industry. The idea came about when Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba started expanding its businesses to thousands of pilot counties across the country, including Zhejiang, one's home. One's first try products were baskets handmade by the villagers, and to their surprise. One day sales reached sixteen thousand U.S. dollars. Just they just said, "You are not rich." They thought I'd fooled them, not believing it was possible until they received the money. They believed. One's determination, combined with loans and subsidies granted through China's anti-poverty drive, paid off, and her promotion and branding of the chilies grown locally have helped farmers shake off poverty. In 2019, Zhejiang became China's largest trading market for chilies. With one quarter of its population serving the industry, one says she dreams for more than just integrating e-commerce into the local chili industry. She wants to see more young people who have left hometown to seek opportunities in big cities return and revitalize the countryside. Having been a migrant worker for years, Tian Ningning has also been able to start his dream business back home. This is the key. Middle-aged women unable to travel for migrant jobs can earn a salary themselves right here. Some poorer families working here are no longer impoverished. Tian is among the more than one million young migrant workers who come back to Henan. They've created eight million additional jobs in recent years, with targeted efforts in infrastructure, housing, and medical assistance. One says the once poverty-stricken village. Is turning into something unbelievably beautiful. When I visited my village last year, I couldn't believe my eyes at all. Neither could my family. But local officials say the anti-poverty drive will continue. The aim: a more equal and sustainable form of development in rural areas. Next, we will advance the infrastructure and living standards in villages that aren't technically defined as impoverished, and we will grow pillar industries so as to consolidate our achievements. One says that when the younger generation stay rooted in the countryside, poverty will never return, and to make sure that happens, opportunity is everything. Opportunity is everything. It's the fact. Since China opened up its economy four decades ago, hundreds of millions have left rural areas for work in southern and coastal cities as a way to fill income gaps. And their choice has made a major contribution to the growth of the world's second largest economy. And over the past decade, things have changed. China has been moving forward with urbanization parallel with its anti-poverty work, and this has not only advanced the rural telecommunication. Infrastructure in the land reform. It's also brought young talents, including entrepreneurs, back home. And experts say they are the dynamic factor to what Chinese leadership calls the rural revitalization, sustainable development for a prosperous society. So opportunities and policies to attract、uh, those talents back would be high on local governments'、uh, agendas. And adding to consolidate what these、uh, counties have achieved,、uh, President Xi Jinping on Saturday stressed the common prosperity share challenge on National P-、uh, Poverty Relief Day, saying the low-income earners have the right to learn. Uh, what poverty is,、uh, what common prosperity is, and how to achieve prosperity through hard work. And officials here say issues like illiteracy and、uh, illness are likely barriers to such realization. And of course,、uh, the government will continue expanding anti-poverty knowledge through talks, lectures, and other measures. And they then want to scale up education programs, provide vocational training for the unemployed. And offer poor families job opportunities, and they also plan to dispatch a dozen of professionals、uh, to each poor village to give know-how and enhance a villager's capacity. And all of these efforts have been implemented also to、uh, prevent a return to poverty. Back to Santai. 
well, opportunity is everything, Jonathan. Yeah, it really. is so good to see. You know, the e-commerce is not only bringing changes or to help local farmers to make a living. They are also bringing, you know, changes, opportunities, and also unlimited possibilities to them. So thank you so much, Zhou Jiaxin, for your reports from Hunan Province. Completely changing the landscape without question. Well, let's jump from Hunan Province now to Yunnan Province in the far southern part of China and bring in our reporter Yang Jinghao, who's live for us in Fugan County. So Jinghao, I know you're with villagers who have been relocated. That is also a central focus of this campaign, so tell us more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, Jonathan, I guess many have, may have never been to or even heard of this place, Fugong. Here I will give you several keywords. Valley. This place just sits in the hinterland of the Nujiang Valley, one of the longest and deepest gorges in the world. Then border. It borders Myanmar to the west. And ethnic minority. Fugong is just home to several unique ethnic minority groups, including Li Su and Nu. Now you may have a, a general picture about this remote place. Yes, remoteness is just a main reason behind its slow development for generations. But today I still have another keyword, change. Uh, actually, uh, Fugong has experienced uh, clear changes during the past few years as the country's poverty eradication drive is pushed forward. One example is uh, the people's living environment. Here I am the county's largest a residential campaign for people relocated from deep mountains. It's very modern and well equipped. More importantly, people don't need to pay a penny for their apartments. For more on this, today I'm joined by a special guest, Mr. Li Yingyu. Uh, he is the uh, executive deputy chief of Fugong County. Welcome to, join, uh, come to join us, Mr. Li. So first, please tell us something about your uh, relocation project, the project of your county. 呃，首先给我们介绍一下，就是你们现在的这个异地安置的一个情况是怎么样的？我们这个安置点呢，已经有一个初建成。The so lock up this relocation actually established at the beginning of this year. So look at all the house built, but at the same time, all the equipment also installed at the same time. You look at this is a kingdom garden as one part of the original plan. So look at the whole look relocation areas. Actually, the home to more than thirteen thousand people, and actually the total population relocated is more than twenty-two thousand. More than 20,000 people have been relocated. That's a huge project. So now the housing problem is settled. Another important uh, issue is that how to help pe local people uh, secure a stable source of income. So come to your questions, actually we have a lot of matters to deal with it. First of all, you look at actually we have a factory built nearby this area. So let's take a tour. So this is the factory that for the poverty alleviation that's basically to produce baseball. So the salary is around the 2000 RMB. And also look at the working hour, it's quite a flex. So if you look at the a employees, they have a job to do at home, like they can deal with their housekeeping issues, and then they can do their work in their free time in this factory. And also we talk about removing our labors, so they also can do job in Guangdong place and also other provinces and also for the a public welfare jobs actually also have these kind of posts available to our villagers and look at the industrial development actually also work and cooperate with the a enterprises so the people also can work in different factories looking into the future what will you do to uh, prevent people falling back into poverty and more importantly to achieve our long-term goal of uh, living a well-loved life. I believe there are three aspects. First of all, education. Education is so important because at the fundamental that for us to prevent the poverty alleviation, pass on to next generation. Sex, we need to change their mindset because they need to adapt their mindset to these new kinds of life. And third, that's the industrial and employment-based development. So look at actually, we have our featured industries like a tea industry, that's actually our pillar. And also we improve people's skill sets. So they have something like they own to expand their living standards. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee.
So uh, eliminating extreme poverty is just the first step. Uh, how to prevent people fall, uh, falling back into poverty is uh, there's still a long way to go. But we believe with more uh, measures put in, into place, uh, more areas like Fugong uh, will see better development. Back to you, uh, Jonathan and Zhou Yuyin. India, without question, once the goal has been met, the journey is not necessarily over. Mm -hmm. Okay, Yang Jinghao live for us. Thanks so much for that. Well, thousands of officials have been hard at work in Chinese countryside after being sent there in 2015 as part of the fight against poverty. CGTN's Guan Yang is in one remote village in northeastern China's Liaoning province to find out how one official has won the trust of local people. From city office to the grasslands, Li Jun is one of the thousands of officials in China sent to the front lines in the campaign to eradicate poverty. At first, persuading the poorest villagers not to be blinded by short-term interest wasn't easy. I'm too old to do farm work. Based on my situation, Li Jun and his team helped me get started with cattle raising. It's been a wise investment for me, as I can now depend on it for my income. Many villagers here worry what will happen after officials like Li Jun leave the village after the anti-poverty campaign is declared a success. Developing a sustainable local economy is the key to long-term victory. Some villagers were tempted to make a quick buck by cashing in on the cattle straight away. Li didn't allow this to happen, advising the villagers to reinvest the money into collective husbandry. They tried many different types of livestock farming and eventually decided to raise sicker deer, high in value, low in risk. More than anything else, I believe building trust with locals is the rule of thumb in poverty alleviation work. It takes patience and persistence to let villagers understand what we are trying to achieve here. The work style has to be down to earth, and to win their trust, we need to earn it. Li has encouraged the villagers to diversify their hard work across multiple areas, from cultivating mushrooms to planting Chinese medicine. The common goal to drag themselves out of poverty and do so in a way that's sustainable and long-lasting. I think the key to the anti-poverty campaign is imparting knowledge and courage to the poor rather than just handing over their allowance to them. Guanyang, CGTN, Liaoning Province. So we are glad you've been joining us for the last mile, our special coverage of China's poverty elimination campaign as they race towards that goal of ending extreme poverty by the end of this year. We are live from Jiangshan Village in Santai County, but we've been focusing on issues and counties all over this country. Exactly. And for more discussions on this issue, we are now joined again by our guests. So one is Professor Zhang Chuanhong from China Agricultural University and also Dr. Alexandra Capiletti, an associate professor from China Xi'an Jiao Tong Liverpool University. So thank you again for joining us the last day, the last show. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start from you, uh, Professor Zhang, because I really want to ask a question from a broader perspective. So how do you see the poverty eradication campaign has changed the lives of farmers and also, you know, villagers across China? Um, I've been visited quite a few villages all over China, and I witnessed the change of people's life uh, in the last few years. And um, one village impressed me most is a village in Tiandong County, Guangxi province. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very remote village. Um, they don't have clean water. The whole villagers use one open water tank. Mm -hmm. um, and the living condition was terrible. There's no road within the village, so the only choice for them is to be relocated. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, I visited that village and almost all the villagers were relocated. And within the relocated community, they have factories um, to provide job opportunities. They have schools, nursery schools, they have community clinic. Everything was there. The most important thing, I think, is really good for 
the poor people to disrupt this kind of intergenerational transmission of poverty mm -hmm. for the future generation. That's really a good thing. But the challenge is for the elderly. The, mm -hmm. Their lifestyle was totally changed. You know, right. it takes time for them to adapt to the new environment. Sometimes they cannot use the elevator. Right. <laughs> so <Right. laughs> they, they want to slip back to their old yeah. um, uh, living place. So that's mm -hmm. something really um, impressive. Yeah, it can be uh, a difficult uh, adjustment yeah. for sure, because we are talking yes. about families that have lived in on this mm -hmm. land, some of them for generations, for, generations. for many, exactly. many years. Yes. But, mm -hmm. you know, Professor Capaletti, I also want to talk about another issue here in China, which is the divide between basically rich and poor, urban, rural. It's a huge concern for the Chinese government to try to fill in that gap between the lives and China's glittering mega cities where there's a lot of wealth and a lot of the farmers out in the countryside. So what do you think China needs to do to further shrink in that divide? Yes, uh, actually the divide has been shrinking in the last 10 years quite substantially and data are, you know, are the evidences of this shrinking. But basically in my opinion, they've just to continue to do what they are already doing, mm -hmm. which is mainly empowering people in the countryside to, um, to m enable them to start their own businesses, for example, through training courses, through special, special programs. Mm -hmm and uh, mm, raising cultural awareness among villagers, for example, by revitalizing the history of the villages mm -hmm. and their cultural traditions, because right. they're very important for residents to, you know, to, to have their awareness, their mm -hmm. identity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also maybe to uh, continue narrowing the um, welfare gap. So, for example, focusing on good quality education for uh, people who live in the rural areas, uh, focusing on providing health facilities in the rural areas, in remote areas, and also uh, devising, uh, let's say, long-term pension schemes. Mm -hmm. But this is something, these measures are, have already been in place for many years, just need to be continued and to be, you know, strengthened, enhanced. strengthened, urgency, yes, perhaps. improved right. as well. Yeah, in the remote areas, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, needs more focus. And right. Without yeah. question. All right, Professor Capaletti, Professor Zhang, we have to leave it there. We thank you both for your time and your insight. It's been great having you with us these mm -hmm. last couple of days. Exactly. Thank you. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Our pleasure. Well, in China's race to ease extreme poverty, local governments has been trying different approaches to boost incomes and also increase jobs. So I got to see that firsthand because earlier I visited one small town that made a major change with one project. Check it out. Liu Xiuyang says everything in her life changed three years ago. She suddenly got a new house, a new neighborhood and a new job. We used to be poor, now we have become rich. She has running water for the first time and a car. The reason? She points across the street to a $20 million amusement park built by a private company with support from the government. With this construction, the people's transportation and living conditions, including water, electricity and gas supply, have been greatly improved. Before, most people here in Galpong village lived off the land. But water was scarce and farming tough. The site, however, sits near a new highway and a short drive from a major city. So town leaders turned to tourism, hoping it would pull them out of poverty. Officials say the park is profitable, attracting 800,000 people a year. Although that's a number certainly hit hard by the pandemic. On our visit, many rides sat quiet. But officials insist tourism is rebounding. And they've invested in new attractions like a petting zoo. Chen Wei has brought his kids here four times. We used to stay at home, just hang out with friends to talk. It wasn't as colorful as what we have now. Liu's old home was one of several bulldozed to make way for the theme park. As compensation, the government gave her this new four-bedroom house for free and a job at the park, which she says doubled what she earned as a farmer. She and her husband now earn about 12,000 U.S. dollars a year far above China's poverty line. We can have more fun and the living conditions are better. And now we have already bought the things that we couldn't even have imagined to buy before.
<laughs> buying things she could have never imagined before and very eager to show them off. Very proud of what she's mm -hmm. accomplished and very proud to see her, her village and her county embark on such an ambitious project. We usually see smaller scale programs out here, right. but to see a large amusement park like that was pretty rare. It was pretty special. It is the experience of a lifetime, mm -hmm. right, Jonathan? Yeah. Well, for more discussions, we are now joined by Ms. Lee Xin, who's the Deputy Director of the International Poverty Reduction Center in China. So hello there, uh, Ms. Lee. Thank you so much for joining us. So we know it's the final year in China's plan to end extreme poverty. So how has this goal been affected to, uh, by the pandemic, according to what you have learned? Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting. As for your question, I, I would like to say that, yes, we have been severely affected by the pandemic and also the flood disaster in the southern part of China. But uh, we are confident that uh, we have mitigated all the negative impact of, uh, of the disaster. And uh, we are confident that uh, we can make it. We can eradicate absolute poverty by the end of this year. Uh, uh, you may ask. Uh, OK, uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yes, continue. Yes, yes, sorry for that. You can continue. OK, uh, as we all know that uh, uh, China, the Chinese government uh, uh, coordinated uh, the uh, economic and the social development with the prevention and control of the pandemic. We uh, push forward the fight against uh, poverty alleviation. On 6th of March this year, an important meeting was held in Beijing. Some uh, uh, special policies have been introduced to help the poor to make sure that uh, we, can, uh, we can meet our goal by the end of this year, such as uh, the uh, poverty supervision, mm -hmm. the employment uh, poverty alleviation, and poverty alleviation okay. through consumption. All I'm these sorry, uh, helped Ms. a Lee. lot. I'm sorry, because we are running out of time. I have to cut, cut you off right now. I'm sorry, but thank you so much for your time and insights. Very optimistic about ending poverty by the end of this year. It's a goal that will likely be met in China. Mm -hmm. We're running out of time, so that does it for us. It's time for us to say goodbye and to thank everyone here for hosting us for the past four years. It's been an incredible journey documenting the last mile as they leave poverty behind. Exactly, and I also want to thank you for joining us and for your attention the past three days. And before we go, let's head back to our colleague Tao Yuan, who is now standing by in Tongchuan, ancient town. So Tao Yuan, you can take the rest of the time. <laughs> Hello, Zoe and Jonathan. So the performance continues on one of Sun Tai's largest public squares on this lovely Sunday night. Once again, we're here in the Tongchuan ancient town, the history of which dates back 1,400 years. Thank so you. if you take a look at the structures behind Thank me, so they're all much. hundreds of years old. So the should, idea like, was to... The idea was to turn this ancient town into a local tour spot, uh, a cultural name card for Suntai, so to speak. Right now, uh, it's got some quite lovely bars and restaurants. Renovation work here started back in 2017. And finally, last year, this ancient town was finally open to the public. Like we said, it's got some quite lovely bars and restaurants to offer, but more importantly, perhaps, I think, museums and rich culture and history as people's standard of, standard of living improves I think there's now a greater need for cultural development as you can probably see on the lovely smiles of these wonderful dancers behind me now with that we've come to the end of our special coverage the last mile for us it's bittersweet emotions because in the past four years we've told inspiring happy stories but also at times heartbreaking stories of a nationwide drive to lift millions of people out of poverty we've came to sun Tai many times to document the changes that are taking place here we've become friends with many of the villagers so for us it's really bittersweet emotions but i suppose the last mile of this journey is also the beginning of the next one how do you make sure that th these impoverished rural population of china stay out of poverty and how do you really inject new energy into to China's rural economy are all tough challenges laying ahead, but I think there are also tremendous opportunities and perhaps even more exciting stories for us to tell. We leave you with the wonderful performance behind me and on behalf of our whole team, thanks for being with us and good night.